Good afternoon. Welcome to Java on Crack. I think this is one of those things where the marketing department might need to have a look at the naming of this and come up with this something slightly better. But the idea behind this is to look at how can we improve the startup time of applications. And as we'll see as we go through the presentation, CRACK stands for Coordinated Restore at Checkpoint. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by that as we go through. My name is Simon Ritter. I work for Azul. So the first thing is, just to give a bit of background, let's think about why is Java so popular? And there are a number of reasons for this. The first is it's a great language. It's easy to write, and even more importantly, it's easy to read. It's one of the reasons that Java has been so popular for so many years. And there are other reasons that Java is so popular. It has lots of libraries. There are lots of frameworks. If you want to write an application, you can pretty much find a library that will help you with parts of that application, and you'll find a free and open source version as well as probably a commercially supported one as well. So lots of help for writing applications. It has great community. All of the people here, you know, we have conferences, we have Java user groups, we have Java champions, all of those sorts of things. And it's easy to find people who can program in Java. All reasons for Java being popular. But really, I think the reason that Java has maintained its number one, number two, or number three status in the kind of surveys that we see from people like Tyobi and Redmonk and other people is because of the Java virtual machine. And that means that we can run applications without needing to recompile them. You know, I used to work for Sun, and we had this marketing phrase which was write once, run anywhere. Or as a lot of people refer to it, write once, test everywhere. And so the idea is that you take your application and you don't need to recompile it. We have bytecodes. We know about that. The other reason that the JVM is so popular is because it has excellent backwards compatibility. You know, you can literally take code that was compiled on JDK 1.2 and run it on JDK 18. It will still run without recompilation. And what you've got with the JVM, the important part of this, is a managed runtime environment. So, as we all know, the JVM takes care of things like garbage collection for you. So the JVM is the thing that's very popular. It's the thing that gives us great performance and all those sorts of things. But that doesn't come without some cost and some drawbacks, if you like. So when we start our applications, what we're dealing with is class files that contain bytecodes. Those are instructions for a virtual machine, obviously, because it's the Java virtual machine. And what we need to do with those bytecodes is convert them into the instructions for the platform we're actually running on. Now, the way that happens is that in different phases, you start off and you take your bytecodes and they get interpreted. What that means is that each bytecode is looked at by the JVM in turn and converted into the necessary instruction or instructions, system calls, to actually make that bytecode do what it's supposed to do. There is no optimization of that other than in a few cases where you see pairs of bytecodes which can actually be converted at the same time. But realistically, we're dealing with one bytecode after another and just doing the same thing every time. It's very inefficient as a way of running an application. And this is one of the reasons why, if you look back to the beginning of Java, it was always criticized as being slow compared to languages like C and C++, because it was slow. Now, what happens then is that the JVM, now that we use the hotspot virtual machine, it will look at how many times you call each method. It will keep a track of the number of invocations of a method, and it will figure out that when you get to a certain threshold, this is a method that gets called a lot. It's a hotspot of code. Great. What we can then do is, rather than interpreting the byte codes, pass it to a compiler and have it generate native instructions for that whole method, JIT compilation. Once that method is used in terms of the, the native code, we'll then profile it to understand how it's being used. And when we get to a second threshold, we'll recompile it using a better compiler that knows how to optimize based on the profiling information that we've collected as it's being run. So this is all good. It gives us much better results than we get if we just run interpreted code. 
The problem with that is that every time you start your process, it has to go through the same thing. It has no knowledge of what's happened before. It's as if you're running the application for the first time. So you have to profile your code. You have to look for those methods that get called frequently. You then have to profile those methods to find out how they're used, feed that back into the second compiler, recompile your code. Every time you start the same application, it's every time it happens. And so what we see is this kind of thing. And this is a sort of generic graph of a Java application. When we start off, in terms of speed of the application, it's very low because we're interpreting our code. We go through the idea of identifying our methods. We compile them with C1, which generates slightly better performing code. We get faster code. Then we get more and more methods until we get to a point where all the frequently used methods have been compiled, optimized as much as possible, and that's our optimum level of performance. And we are used to this because this is the application warm-up. It's a warm-up time associated with a typical Java application. And as I say, the problem is that if we run our application, we see this kind of graph. And if we run our application again, we see the same graph. And if we run it again, we see the same thing. There's no ability to remember things across runs. What we really want is to run our application, get it warmed up, get it to the point where everything is compiled, and then just carry on as if we had started from the same place. And then if we want to run it again, we get the same effect. So this would be ideal if we could do that. So there are various ways that we can improve the startup time of applications. First of those is something that came uh, a while ago. I think it was actually in JDK 11. This got included as uh, part of OpenJDK as a, a standard feature rather than being what Oracle classified as a commercial feature. Application class data sharing. So what this does is it simply says, when you start an application, the first thing the JVM does is it has to load the classes that you need for the application. And then you have to initialize those classes, and the JVM will build some internal data structures that it uses for those classes. Rather than doing that every time you start an application, what you can do is write the data out into a file, so you take your internal data structures, write them out to a file, and then the next time you start the same application, the JVM knows that it's got that file available, it can simply map that file into memory in the right place, and so all of your data structures are there straight away. That's good because it reduces the amount of time it takes to load and initialize classes. But it doesn't address any of the issues of compilation. So it's a start, improves things a bit, but doesn't really make a big difference for our application. Well, OK, so then there's the other approach. Why not use ahead of time compilation? Why not go down the route of what people have done in the past with C and C++? Rather than compiling to bytecodes, let's compile into native instructions directly and run those, and we should get better performance. Well, yes, OK. So no interpreting in bytecodes, that's good. We don't have to go through that sort of phase. We don't have to analyze where the methods have hotspots. And we don't have to do any runtime compilation of code, which means we're not stealing resources from the CPU in order to do compilation at the same time that we're running our application. All of that looks very good. The other thing we get, of course, is we start up at full speed. There's no this warm up, which is simply go into compiled code, so full, full level of performance straight away. So this is the approach that Graal, the Graal VM, takes with their native image, is to compile the code ahead of time, create a native image that you can then run directly. So, OK, so we've solved the problem. So that's the end of it. Oh, right, end of my presentation. Use Graal. No. <laughs> not so fast. And this is uh, an attempt at a play on words. Because ahead of time definition is, by definition, static. So we are fixing the compilation that we're using when we run the compiler. Okay? And the code is compiled before it's run. Very logically, it's ahead of time compilation. The problem with that is that the compiler has no knowledge of how the code is actually going to run. 
You can do analysis of the code that you've got. You can look for code paths through there. But you have no information about what will actually be used and how that code will work when the application is running. There is a partial solution to that. It's been around for a long time, which is called profile-guided optimization. You compile your code with a static compiler. You run it, and you generate some profiling information as it's run. You then take that profile and you feed it back into the compiler, recompile your code, given that you have now knowledge of what will happen when you run the application, and use that to optimize your code further. That's the approach that the Graal Enterprise Edition takes. But the problem with that is it only helps partially. It doesn't solve all of our problems. Let me give you some examples. There are these things called speculative optimizations. And this is what you can do with a JIT compiler, which you can't do with ahead-of-time compiled code. First example I want to give you is the idea of an um, inline monomorphic site. If I've got a class called animal, and I'm just encapsulating some simple state here, I've got a color. And so I make that private, and I provide an accessor method, get color. All that's going to do is return the color. Great. Now, if I call the get color method on my animal object, what I'm going to return is very logically the color, but it involves a method call. So stack frame has to be created, call the method which is only going to return the color, and then pop the stack frame off again. If the compiler can look at that and know that that hasn't been overridden by another subclass, and we only have one implementation of get color, then it can very logically say, well, rather than actually calling the method, because I'm compiling the code and I know what I'm doing, I can simply say, well, let's treat that variable as if it's public and then reference it directly rather than having to create the stack frame, retrieve the value, and then pop the stack frame off. So that gives us an improvement in terms of performance. We've, we've eliminated the requirement for actual method call. But that only works if we only have one implementation of get color. Slightly more complicated example um, what I've used here is it, it, it's slightly convoluted, but it gives you a good example of how this can actually work. I've got a method here which is called compute magnitude. I pass in a value to it, and then I've got a conditional that says if the value is greater than 9, I'm going to call another method, compute bias, with that value and generate the bias that I want to use. If the value is not greater than 9, I'll set the bias to 1. And then I'm going to return the log base 10 of the bias plus 99. What we can do is we can profile that code as it's running. And we can do branch analysis, which essentially counts how many times we go through the true branch, how many times we go through the false branch. If, when we come to compile our code, we find that we have never been through the true branch, we can speculate that in the future, we will also never go through the true branch. And that way, we can have the compiler optimize this code based on that assumption. So we're making an assumption about how the code is going to work based on how the code has worked previously. What the compiler can then do is actually do a lot more in terms of optimization, not just looking at how to make simple optimizations. It can do something like this. It can say, if the value is greater than 9, well, we still have to be able to deal with that because we have a contract between us, the developer, and the compiler that says we've got a, both a true and a false branch. If the value is greater than 9, we'll call uncommon trap. And uncommon trap basically says we made an assumption about how this code was going to work. Turns out that assumption was false. So the code that you compiled for this now needs to be thrown away, and we need to recompile it based on the fact that we can also go through the true branch. That's a de-optimization, and that's very bad because we've compiled code, which now we don't need. We have to recompile it, so we've wasted time and resources. However, so long as this stays true, <laughs> it stays true is that we haven't been through the true branch, so it's actually false. Um, so long as we always have a false evaluation there, then we can simply say, well, if the bias is 1, we know that 1 plus 99 is 100, and the log base 10 of 100 is you know, two. So we can eliminate all of the necessary work there. We don't have to have the addition. We don't have to have the call to log base 10 in the math class. Just eliminate all of that and return two. 
So this is an excellent way of improving the performance of our code, and it only works if we can do that at runtime, because we can compile the code at runtime, and if something changes, then we can throw away the code and we can recompile it and still run things in the same way. So speculative optimizations are very important in terms of performance. Um, at Azul, we've done an analysis of a lot of code that we generate from our compiler, and we found that over 50% of the improvement in performance that we get is down to speculative optimizations. So it is very important if you want to get the maximum level of performance from your application code. The, the thing that we really want to do is to avoid de-optimizations. So if we can find a way of um, getting around that, then uh, obviously, we avoid wasting CPU cycles and so on. So if we compare the two, AOT and JIT, and we look at the, the two different things, on the AOT side, obviously, we've got the idea of class loading prevents method inlining. This is one of the things we can't do with AOT. Because Java as a language is dynamic in the sense of being able to load classes at runtime, if we want to do a head of time compilation, we might not know when we call a method whether or not it's the method that will actually get called at runtime because we could load another class. So we have to be conservative in terms of our method in lining. There are other things we can't do with a head of time compilation that Java does in certain situations. So there's no ability to generate bytecodes at runtime. Um, some applications do that. Reflection is a lot more complicated. If you look at the way that has to work with the head of time compilation, you effectively have to declare all the things you're going to reflect on before you compile the code. So it, it's quite messy in terms of being able to do that. Definitely unable to use speculative optimizations in the same way. Um, there are some situations where you can try and do it but with profile guided optimization, but it's not ideal. So the overall performance is typically, typically going to be lower than with JIT compilation. The plus side of that, though, is obviously you get full speed from the start, and you reduce the problems of the CPU overhead because you're not compiling any code. So there's the advantages. On the JIT side, obviously we can use aggressive method inlining because we're compiling code at runtime. We know exactly which classes are loaded at any point, so we can inline a method because we know which method will be called. We can use bytecode generation at runtime. Reflection is, and I put it in brackets, relatively simple because reflection is never what you would describe as simple. But you can do reflection as, as a, wherever you want to do reflection. You can use speculative optimizations. And so your overall performance is typically going to be higher. Downside, of course, is that you require warm-up time and the CPU overhead to compile the code as you're running. So if we look at the sort of comparison of this, this is the graph I showed you earlier. And if we take that optimum level of performance and we say that's JIT compiled code, and we compare that to what we would get with a head of time compiled code, we see instant startup, but the performance level that we're going to get overall is going to be lower than we will eventually get with JIT compiled code because of speculative optimizations. Even if we use profile-guided optimization, yes, that will raise the bar a bit. We can get better performance than we can get with just doing static compilation, but it's never going to give us the same level of performance that we would get with full JIT compilation. So this is the, the, the problem that we face. So what about a different approach? So this is where we get into the idea of crack, which is a project that we started at Azul, and we looked at how could we effectively freeze an application at a particular point and then allow it to continue from another point, or from the same point, but later on. Now, if you look at Linux, there is some technology already built into Linux that does something similar. It's called Coordinated Resume in User Space, or CRYU, or CRYU, as some people try to pronounce it. And the idea behind this is to take a running Linux application and say, I want to pause that application. I want to freeze its state, and then I want to be able to reuse that application and start it up from the same point a little bit later in time. Now, the idea here is to create what's called a snapshot of the application state. So you take all of your registers, you take your stack, you take your memory that's being used by the application, put that into a file, 
And then when you want to reload it, you simply say, OK, take the memory, map it back into the memory that we've got, reload the registers with the values, take the stack, reload that, and then take your program counter, which you had frozen as well, and restart your application. I mean, it's, it's a very logical thing to do, because if you think about it, uh, if, you, if you know a lot about Linux, the idea of having processes that can be swapped out, then it's essentially doing that kind of thing. So you can swap a process out, take all of its state, and uh, then load it back in again so that you can run multiple processes on the same CPU. And as I put the this diagram here at the bottom, it's you know essentially a von Neumann machine where you've got input, you've got state that's being held in the machine. As long as we can freeze that state, there's no way for the application to know, no way really for it to know that it's actually restarted later on. I guess you could look at the timestamp and say, okay, well, that's moved on something. But essentially, so long as the program counter is at the same place, your registers have the same values, the stack is the same, it has no way of knowing that it's just continuing at a later point in time. So this is all very good. Potentially, you could move it to a different physical machine as well. Uh, there are ways of doing that. So the, the thing with Cryo is it is mainly implemented in user space, as you would expect. There are a few kernel things that are required for it, but they've been in the kernel since 3.11, so really any uh, Linux distribution that you're using will support this. And the kind of idea behind this originally was to allow for migration of containers for microservices. You could take a container, freeze it, and then move it around onto different machines. The, the set of features that it supports is very extensive, and it's quite interesting to look at this, because obviously you can support freezing a process, you can have all the threads within that process can be frozen, the application memory, very logically, also memory map files and shared memory. Now, this is where things start to get complicated, because if you think about it, if you have a memory map file or shared memory with another process, Certainly, if you move that to another machine, that's going to make life very difficult. Uh, even on the same machine, if you've got a memory mapped file or, or shared memory, and the other process is still running, then you could end up with all sorts of inconsistencies because the things have changed between when you took your snapshot and when you restarted it. Same thing with like open files, pipes, FIFOs. They are actually supported on Cryo, but it becomes a lot more complicated because how do you deal with the fact that a file may have changed or may have disappeared between when you made the checkpoint and when you actually restarted it? Same thing with sockets, inter-process communication channels, all of those sorts of things. But they are all supported in Cryo. It even provides a way of rebuilding a TCP connection across a network from one side. So you don't actually need to have a negotiation by sending packets back and forth. There is a way of actually rebuilding the, the TCP stack on one side only. Now, obviously, if we think about the Java virtual machine, that is simply a process. So why not simply say, take the Java virtual machine process, use Cryo on it, pause it, and then restart it, and everything should just work? Hmm, yeah, well, it does get more complicated, doesn't it? Because obviously, if you've got open files, if you've got shared memory, all of those things are going to be very difficult, especially if you try and move them to a different machine. The other thing is, if, what, what if you take that state and you try and restart it multiple times? Because you could do that, but then you could end up, again, with all sorts of problems in terms of the inconsistency of state and having different um, instances of the same process trying to access things and go through a whole lot of uh, difficulties in that point of view. So JVM could think about itself as, yeah, okay, it'll work. It should just uh, start off from the point where it was frozen and continue and everything should work. But, hmm. So what we came up with is this idea of coordinated restore at checkpoint, crack. And we thought, okay, we can use Cryo as a way of pausing the JVM part of our application, but we need to do more at the Java level. We need to have more coordination so that we can eliminate some of those problems that we would get if we just froze the application state and then tried to restart it at some later point. So the way this works is, is actually quite simple. It's quite straightforward. You have your application running, and at some point you decide you want to make a checkpoint. So when you decide you want to make a checkpoint, what we will do is we will make the application aware that it is about to be checkpointed. 
That way, the application can do certain things to make sure that it is ready to be frozen, to be checkpointed. We can then take that checkpoint information, we can store it, and then at some point later, we want to restart our application. When we do that, what we can do is again make the application aware that it is being restarted from a checkpoint. So it knows it's about to be stopped, and then it knows that it's being restarted from, a certain, from that point. That way, if we need to tidy things up, if we need to restart things, then those can be handled both by the shutdown and then the restart. So from that point of view, quite straightforward. So the other thing that we do with Crack is we enforce more restrictions on what the application can and cannot do as it's being checkpointed. So we do not allow open files. We do not allow open network connections. We simply say, if you've got an open file, then you have to close it before you make the checkpoint. If you've got an open network connection, you must shut that down before you uh, make the checkpoint. That way, when you start the application up again, it's up to the application code to go, right, I know I'm being restarted. I had those files open. I need them open again. You can then open the file, and you can do things like comparing checksums to see if the file has changed between when you did the checkpoint and when you did the restart. That way, if you need to handle that in a specific way, you can. Again, network connections can be re-established. You can do that in a, a very controlled way. So you've, you've got much more uh, reliability built into this. So if you do have open files, if you do have uh, open network connections, then we may even say, well, no, you can't do that, so we will refuse to create a checkpoint for you. To do this, we provide a very simple and very straightforward API. So because it's coordinated, there is something you have to do in terms of your application code. What we deal with here are resources. So we create an interface called, very originally, resource, and it has two methods that you need to implement. Before checkpoint, after restore. I bet you can't guess what you have to do there. So the idea is that obviously when you're about to be checkpointed, before checkpoint will be called. And then it's up to you to create the code for that to say, right, I've got these files open, close them down. I've got these network connections open, close them, and so on. When you get the after restore method called, it's up to you to open the files, open the network connections. You write the code to do that. So the idea is that you have classes in your application where you know that you're using certain types of resources or things need to be done that will affect how a checkpoint happens and then a restore happens. So any of those classes that you need to have notified when a checkpoint and restore is going to happen, you will implement the resource interface. How you use that resource interface is by saying, OK, we need to register resources with a context. Context is a way of the JVM knowing which classes need to be notified of the checkpoint and restore. So again, it's very simple. You have a context that's associated with the JVM. You can either create your own, or you can, from the, what's the core class that we have, you can get a global context. So very simple, you take your resources and you will register those with the context, having retrieved the context from the get global context of the core. So it's as easy as that. You simply say, right, these are the classes that I know I'm going to have to notify of the checkpoint and restore, implement resource interface, register those with the context, and everything then works. So like I say, the global context maintains a list of the resources that are being used by your application, and then for each of those resources, the before checkpoint method will be called when we're about to do a checkpoint. And the order of that is quite important. So the order of the um, before checkpoint will be called in the order that you've registered the resources with the context. When we do the after restore, we will do the reverse order. So it's the idea that you can say, OK, I've got A, B, C resources. I'm going to call the before checkpoint on A, then B, then C. When we do the rest restore, we'll call those so that we do the after restore on C, then B, then A. That way, you've got a, a very uh, clear ordering. So that if you do need to do things in a particular way, and um, one thing relies on another, then you can do it in the order that you need to do it and know that the, the order will be reversed 
on the restore so that everything can be tight, uh, tidied up and then restored in the right way. So it gives you this predictable restoration of important state. That's the most important thing about that. So as a simple example, um, let's take Jetty, Jetty server. So we create a class called server class, it's got a server, and we'll set up a, a simple server on port 8080, and we'll create a handle for that, and then we'll start the server. Right, wonderful. If we want to use crack, we can do it in two different ways. We can do an external initialization, or we can do internal. Externally, we use J command. All you need to do is say J command on your jar file, and issue a jdk.checkpoint command to that, the JVM will say, ah, oh, right, you want to do a checkpoint. It will then use the list of resources, call the before checkpoint method on all of them, use cryo underneath to actually create the snapshot, and then when you want to start it up again, you can use that snapshot. So it's as simple as just uh, executing a J command on that. If you do that, you will see this method, you will see this message. So it will say, command executed successfully. Now, this is one of those things that I think we actually need to change because the command did not succeed successfully. If you look at the log file, you'll actually see this. It'll say, uh, checkpoint open socket exception because we have an open socket, we're running a server, and so it will tell you that, no, we couldn't actually create the snapshot, um, even though it said the command succeeded, it didn't. Like I say, that needs to be changed. So if we want to make that work, what we need to do is use the core class, get the global context, and register the um, server manager class as a resource. We implement the resource interface, therefore we have the two methods before checkpoint and after restore. In this case, very simple, all we're gonna do in the before checkpoint is stop the server, so we no longer have an open socket, and then when we restart in the after restore, we'll start the server up again and create the connection. So that, that all should work, and we'll then get a um, checkpoint on that. As I said, we can also do it internally. We can do it programmatically if we want to, and get to a point where we, all we need to do is use the core class again and call checkpoint restore on that. And effectively, what happens there is that's the sort of, in your code flow, you get to the, the uh, you call checkpoint restore, that will then create the checkpoint for you, when you return from that method is after you've done the restore. So it will then proceed from there. Right, so how good is this actually? Well, what we did was we did some proof of concept on this. And we took several sort of workloads, representative workloads, and we took a machine and we said, right, let's start up an application, sample application, and see how long it gets, takes to get to the first operation that we can process data. And if you look at Spring Boot, which you know, lots of people use, on the machine that we tested this on, it was just under four seconds to get to our first, um, pr processing the first uh, operation. Using a crack restore, 38 milliseconds. So that's two orders of magnitude faster. 38 milliseconds as opposed to nearly four seconds. We also tried mic Micronaut. That took um, just over, well, literally about a second to get to first operation. And again, two orders of magnitude really faster with 46 milliseconds using the checkpoint restore. Quarkus, which is you know, designed for super fast startup, um, that was 980 milliseconds on the machine that we ran it on. We got that down to 33 milliseconds with uh, restore at checkpoint. Uh, also, XML transform, which is probably not the best example, but that was, again, four seconds down to 53 milliseconds. So you can see that the, the improvement in terms of startup time is, is very, very noticeable. It's really quite impressive what, how quickly you can start up an application. Similar thing is if you look at uh, you know, time to complete a number of operations. Because you're not going through the warm-up phase, you're starting instantly with fully warmed up code. That's the really important thing to remember about this. It's not just the state of your application that's being loaded. All of that compiled code that was generated by the JIT compiler, all those speculative optimizations, are available from you know, literally as soon as you load the code. That way, throughput is also improved, so the time that it takes to complete a number of operations is reduced because you don't have to go through the warm-up phase. Red line on this case is uh, with Spring Boot, so that's OpenJDK. 
so you see warm up on the application that's slower at the beginning then you get into the uh, the performance level so how long it takes to process things is lower with using crack as well um, just as another example this is Quarkus and you can see that the gap is slightly bigger just because of the way that the code gets compiled and how long it takes to compile that particular set of code so summarize on this basically crack is an interesting way to pause a JVM application then what you can do is you can restore it at some later point and the other thing you can do is possibly do that multiple times Obviously, the benefit of this is extremely fast startup. But the, what you don't lose is all of the things that you lose if you're doing ahead of time compilation. You don't lose the ability to do JIT compilation. You don't lose the ability to do speculative optimizations. Because remember, it's just starting from the same point. So even if the profile of your application changes and you need to de-optimize, you still have the ability to do that even though you started from a checkpoint, because it's still running in exactly the same way. It's using the JIT compiler. Everything works like that. So it eliminates the a need for hotspot identification, all that warm-up time, method compiles, recompiles, de-optimization. Um, it is an open JDK project now. Uh, we've contributed this. We asked the open JDK community if they wanted this to be a project. They said yes. Um, we're getting some interest from other organizations. People like Red Hat have expressed an interest. Um, Amazon have expressed an interest. They're, they're very interested in this for the purpose of doing things like lambdas. So if you've got serverless computing where you want to start something up very, very quickly, then this is ideal for that, where it's only going to be short-lived. Um, a couple of references there. Uh, there's a wiki page that we've created for this and also a GitHub repo where you can download the... Uh, there's a JDK 17 version of this available. So I'm now actually going to do your demo. So let me just put my glasses on because I'm old. Right. So what I'm going to do... Uh, let me see. Um, now, hopefully this is going to work because I actually because it only runs on Linux, remember. Um, this is one of the reasons that we... we, we I, I think it's going to take a while to get it into the mainstream of Java, if at all, because um, it requires uh, us to find a way of doing this on multiple operating systems. And at the moment, it only runs on Linux. So the reason I'm, I'm running this remotely is because... I'm running a Mac, which isn't running Linux, obviously. So what I'm doing is actually logging into my machine at home, which is running Linux. So if I go to... Right, so I've got the, this set up with an example application. And essentially what this application is going to do is it's sort of... Um, just to sort of give an idea of what can happen, we created an application which just generates... Um, numbers, so prime numbers. And what it does is it fills a cache with prime numbers. And it takes time to do that. It's filling a, a cache of 100,000 prime numbers. And if we run the application, and let's see where are we? So I've run the application. What it's going to do is it's going to repeat filling the cache. And um, then uh, over time, it will time out elements in the cache. So it takes, it takes a few seconds to, to start filling the cache. But, so this is the idea of the application is actually warming up, not just in terms of the compiled code, but also in terms of what the application actually does. So you can think of this as like um, processing data and getting things up to the speed that it needs to. So in that case, it took 22 seconds to generate, or was it 63,000 elements? Cache is 63% full. So it's gradually getting to the point where as it generates more elements, it'll start speeding up and, and that's all, all good. Um, so now we're down to about 30 milliseconds to, to run each iteration. Now, if I run a J command on this to generate a checkpoint of that, what we'll see, okay, yeah, so you can see that it's, it's calling before checkpoint and we've generated a, a checkpoint of that. So now what I've got is a set of files. Um, if I just show you that. Uh, So th these are all the images uh, of the, the, the uh, different things that I've generated. Um, probably should have done that. Um, okay, well, I'll leave that. But um, 
Yeah, so there's, there's some big files, obviously, um, for some of the, the stuff where you've got the, the heap and whatever you need to actually um, write out to a file. But a lot of the files are quite small as well. Now, if I restart that, and the scripts I'm using just basically do Java with a set of command line flags, so there's nothing very exciting. Um, it's just easier than me trying to type in front of you, which never works very well. Um, so if I do restore, what we'll see is immediately you can see that it's not running at 22 milliseconds, so it isn't going through the startup that I would need to go through in terms of the um, application. The other thing you'll see if I just stop that. Uh, let's control. So um, if you look at that, you'll see that um, when we stopped it, it was on run 11, uh, which took 20, 26 milliseconds. And when we were on uh, run, when we restarted it, we started from run 12, because obviously that was where we paused the application and we got the same speed. Now, what I can do is I can restore the same application from the same point. And if I do that, we'll see, OK, we're starting from run 12 again. So it's, it's started from exactly the same point, and I can restore it as many times as I want. Um, the other thing I would say about that was, um, <laughs> there was there was quite an interesting thing when we were developing this, because, because the cache times out, what we found was that when we paused the application and we came back, the first time we did it, it started effectively from the beginning. And we were like, well, hang on, it shouldn't do that. But then we realized it was the problem of the timestamp had changed. And because the timestamp had changed by so much, all of the elements in the cache had been invalidated straight away. And so it then started to try and refill it. And this was one of those things where it taught us a lesson about how to use the, the checkpoint restore. And in the um, before checkpoint, we had to then um, store the, the timestamp so that when we restored the checkpoint, we used the stored checkpoint, took the difference between the current time and the, uh, the new time, and then applied that to the cache so that we didn't invalidate everything from the cache straight away. So it was a good example of, of understanding that there's a little bit more work that has to be done in terms of um, when you're doing a checkpoint and restore, because obviously time has changed between those two runs. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what it is we've done with uh, checkpoint restore. Java on crack. Uh, like I say, it's a very interesting project, I think, has a lot of potential. So with that, thank you very much. And, and since I do have a few minutes, if people have got any questions, uh, there's somebody with a microphone there. So if anyone's got a question, uh, there's one at the back there, one there, one there. Oh, right next to the microphone there. Um, question, can you, can you invoke it from within the application, so not externally? But some send some signal to the application itself to kind of to 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 save its state and shut down. Um, I, I, yes. So so remember, there's two ways of doing it. So you can either do it with a J command, so externally, or you can do it from uh, programmatically by calling the uh, the checkpoint internally. So if you, if you wanted to send the message across a network, for example, you could do that, and you could um, you could send it to the application and tell it to do a checkpoint. So it's completely flexible in that sense. So yes, uh, I'm pretty sure that whatever you However you wanted to do it, there is a way of, of creating a checkpoint from that, yes. Uh, more questions? <laughs> You're down the back there. Uh, my question is around uh, like dockerizing it. Is it possible to maybe do something along that space? Yes, and in fact, that, that is one of the things, because if I were to try and do, um, let me see if I can do this. Um, so if I restart, the application there. So I'll, I'll let it run. Now, if I do... So if I try and restore the same application twice on the same machine, it won't let me do it. Because, of course, it's got a process ID, and it won't allow me to do that. So putting it in a Docker container is actually a very good way of solving that problem. Because you, if you can do a Docker container, then you can have multiple containers on the same machine. It doesn't matter that it's the, the same, effectively the same process ID. So the answer is yes. And in fact, we, we've actually we had a little bit of difficulty making that work, because it turns out that Docker also uses Cryu. So we were trying to use Cryu on top of Cryu. And there were some things that we had to do to get around that. But yes, um, as you say, putting it in a Docker container does work very well. It's a great idea for, to, for using this effectively, because you can effectively freeze the state, put it in a container, and then deploy that around wherever you want it to, and it will work. So yes. Do you have any example project, like somewhere in GitHub, with um, showing this? If you look on the wiki page, I'm not sure if we've got a Docker container yet as an example, um, but I know my colleague Garrett um, is working on that, so um, keep an eye on that, and we will have an example soon. Okay, thank you. 
or is there another one at the back? Was uh, there? Maybe that's closer. Thank you. Uh, uh, how big is the overhead of the basically that snapshot files? Because um, that depends to some extent on how you set up your application and how your application works. Because clearly we have to maintain all the state of your application. So if you've got a you know 20 gigabyte heap which is full or nearly full, uh, you are going to have some very big uh, checkpoint files. If you're running a smaller heap, I mean, uh, what did I see there? There's um, so I've got pages there, which is looking at, I can't even remember, so three, so, so 1.7 gigabytes on that file alone. Um, so probably I'm running a two gig heap on that. Um, so yes, the files can be potentially big because we have to maintain all of the state. So the more state you have, the more we have to write out. Uh, I think that's the easiest way of, of explaining that. Yeah, okay. There was another one down the front here, I think. Was there somebody? There's one there. <laughs> Hi. Uh, actually, I would like to ask how you are handling or running friends before calling before uh, checkpoint. I guess you need to stop to come to some safe points. So if you are stopping all running friends, it means you are freezing application before uh, finalizing checkpoints. And if heap is big, it means the freezing of application will be bigger. So how you are handling this part? And second question is, Actually, the first one is uh, I need to start my, stop my logging subsystem also because we are writing to STDIOT, which is file descriptor also. So I should stop my logging subsystem also as a file descriptor, basically. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so to answer the second question, so the logging framework, yeah. I mean, you, you have to, any, anything that would have an open file descriptor, you would have to be responsible for shutting that down. So if you're using a logging system that logs to files or across a network, then you would have to shut that down um, temporarily and then restart it in the uh, thing. Um, what was, sorry, what was the, the first question was? How you're managing the running threads before calling, before checkpoint, because you need to stop. Oh, threads. Yeah. yeah. Um, so essentially, we, we, we get the JVM to pause all threads um, so at the point where we want to do a checkpoint. So we, we simply pause all the threads, and then we look through the list of um, resources, and we call the before checkpoint method on those. So yes, as soon as you, you, you determine that you want to create a checkpoint, we would pause all the threads, and then uh, create a checkpoint. And then when you restart it, obviously, we know which threads we've got, and you can restart all the threads again from the same point. I mean, there's a lot of complexities in there because, of course, you know, when you've got multiple threads involved, but because they, they're effectively in a fixed state, then we can just move that and then create a new, uh, restart everything from the same state when we do a restore. So it, it works, yes. But it will freeze applications, so users will get some uh, errors, etc., right? Because it's freezing applications, so basically not responding for any request anymore. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, essentially, as, as soon as you do a checkpoint, that application is no longer running as a, a, an application, so it will no longer respond to anything. Um, yeah. Hi. On the slide about Project Cry, you implied that it could uh, deal with open files and sockets, but Crack can't. Is there a reason for that restriction? Um, I think it was just the way we designed it. We just thought it would be easier because we're doing a coordinated idea that if we wanted to move things to other machines and uh, have it work in that way, it was going to be much better if we imposed more restrictions um, so that it was easier to do that. So but it's for portability more yeah, than... Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't think there was any limitation in terms of why we couldn't do it because of the fact that Cryu allows you to do it. Um, we just decided that it would be tidier to restrict people to doing that so it makes it easier to, to actually restart applications. One right in the back there. Two minutes left. Um, is there um, a plan to support storing only the kind of interesting bits of JVM for the for the warm up and not the application state itself? <laughs> yeah, we already have that. It's called Ready Now. Um, so if you if you look at what we've done at Azul, one of the things we created was was to try and address the problem of warm up. Um, but from the point of view of the compiled code rather than the application state. So um, ready now, which is part of our um, prime JVM, or what used to be called Zing, what that does is it allows the application to warm up, and then we take a snapshot of the 
loaded classes, the initialized classes, all of the profiling data that was gathered, and we also now keep a copy of the compiled, compiled code. So when you restart the application, you can immediately load the, uh, the class data, you can immediately reload the compiled code and go from that point. So we've done that for compiled code. This is actually more about not just compiled code, but also state as well. Okay. And with that, I think I've just about run out of time, so thank you very much again.